we hear next from uh, Dr. Michael Posner. Um, Javi said at the very beginning, um, sort of alert, as did Judge Aiken, alerted you to just the, the gravitas of uh, Dr. Posner's work. Um, you should check out uh, his amazing body of work. He uh, founded the Sackler Institute at Wild Cornell Medical School in New York, where he still hold uh, position. Uh, Professor Merritt is here at the Department of Psychology and has just made landmark study after landmark study um, over his 50-year career and is still contributing um, wonderful studies, now at the cutting edge, and we're going to hear some about that work now. So thank you, Dr. Poston. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. You've seen this diagram a couple times today, so it's kind of an exam. It should be... <laughs> It should be easy to follow during my talk because I'm only going to be talking about the relationship between the anterior cingulate and these areas of the ventral striatum. So only those two areas. These are the pathways that are involved in addictions from the Kube work and work that you heard cited twice uh, already today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the ACC striatum connections because uh, we think they're involved in the craving for drugs and also because we think the ACC is very important in the ability of the person to control that craving. Now, my talk is about mindfulness because my colleague, Yuan Tong, came to me some years ago. He had developed a method of mindfulness training which he argued could be effective in five days in changing the person's overall attention in reducing negative affect and so on. Five days of training, half hour a day, I thought, well, if that were true, we could really show that by a clinical type trial, which takes a number of people and randomizes them either to that training method, which he calls integrated mind-body training, a, a type of mindfulness meditation, or to a plausible active control for which we use relaxation training, which most of you know is part of cognitive behavioral therapy. So we have a group of people uh, who are given five days or a month of meditation training, or they're randomized to the control group. And we look at the difference between these two groups. And uh, what we found was something that fits very well with these addiction pathways. That is, we found that the IBMT group showed greater activation following a month of meditation training in the anterior cingulate gyrus, increased activation. And they also showed changes in white matter as measured by diffusion tensor imaging. Now, you've both been tutored on activation with MRI by Tavi this morning, and also on use of diffusion tensor imaging to trace white matter pathways. Well, our idea was that if, in fact, we could improve the ability of a person to use mechanisms in the anterior cingulate to damp down or change emotional responses coming from the limbic area, this might be a way of controlling some forms of addiction. The form of addiction we used was tobacco addiction. Maybe not the central issue here today, but it's a legal, it's a legal uh, drug, tobacco. And also, my colleague Iwan moved to Texas there were lots of smokers. You know, <laughs> Oregon doesn't have that many. And uh, what we used was uh, a CO meter to measure the carbon monoxide emitted, which is related to the number of cigarettes smoked, both before and after. Now, we recruited not to stop smoking. We recruited only to reduce stress. And so we recruited some smokers and some non-smokers. The smokers, before any training, show greatly reduced activity in the anterior cingulate. They seem to follow the idea that they had less self-regulation or self-control than the non-smokers. After a month 
of IBM T, half hour a day, five day week. Um, we found that the activity of the anterior cingulate was increased in the smokers so that they, appro uh, in, in, they approach the non-smokers in activation. And we also found that the amount of cigarette smoking was greatly reduced. Now, many of these people didn't plan to quit smoking. In fact, they hadn't really thought about it. And even after the training, many of them didn't realize the extent to which they had cut down on their smoking. As you can see from this, oops, as you can see from this slide, in the IBM T group, there was about a 60% reduction. And these people down here with one cigarette a day, as measured by the CO meter, are probably effectively having reduced their smoking. And uh, it, with the relaxation training, there was really no change at all. So we did establish that this was effective in reducing smoking. And uh, interestingly enough, the persons themselves, if you ask them their, uh, their degree of smoking, uh, the, uh, the amount of smoking change that they felt they had made, had nothing to do with the amount that they actually smoked. So it didn't seem that the improvement was due to intention or goals or other things. It seemed to be due to the change that it had taken place in them, which simply did not lead to his great craving for cigarettes. And so some of the people said, uh, when we told them, look, you, you, before this you smoked 10 to 15 cigarettes a day. Now you only smoke one or so. Oh, yeah, I do think I've been spending less on my cigarettes lately. <laughs> so they were often very surprised. Now, of course, this study is limited only to cigarette smoking, only one addiction. Although the idea that I introduced on the first slide is that many addictions involve the same pathways, so it's possible it could work with other addictions. But there's a deep question to be asked here. How could a purely mental exercise of holding your attention in the present moment, even if sustained for half an hour a day for a month, how could that lead to physical changes like the change in white matter? This is the question I ask myself and a lot of other skeptical people hearing about this result ask me as well, including my brother. So, <laughs> I decided to try to come up with a hypothesis which might link uh, meditation and what it did, did to changes in white matter. And uh, the main thing here is that IBM T, we showed, produces, following the training, a much stronger frontal theta rhythm. The theta rhythm is about six hertz four to eight hertz in the human, usually thought of as the theta rhythm, and it produced a strong frontal theta. That's not unique to IBM T. Almost all the studies of mindfulness meditation have shown changes in frontal theta. Frontal theta has been leaked, uh, linked to the release of proteases, which can change dormant oleodendrocytes, that is, cells that myelinate pathways, to active ones. So our idea was that this frontal theta was the critical uh, ingredient that allowed the attention change to produce a change in white matter. How to test it. In order to test this idea, we really needed to know whether the myelin was changed and and or, or whether axons themselves were changed. If you remember Tavi's early lecture, these are the wires, the axons, which connect cells together, and they're wrapped by a protein sheath called myelin. And so we decided to use an animal model where we could impose a theta rhythm on the cells, particular cells in the anterior cingulate, to see if that would produce a change in myelination or white matter. 
and we're part way through this effort, but I thought I would share it with you because I think it begins to provide a kind of mechanism or way of thinking mechanistically about how a mental uh, activity like meditation might actually change parts of the brain. This is the team that has worked with uh, me uh, on this problem. The critical person here probably is uh, Chris Neal. He's uh, trained in optogenetics. So we engineered mice so that a laser implanted in the anterior cingulate could turn cells on and off at any speed we decided to do it. And we used 1, 8, and 40 hertz stimulation. Again, we were using a mouse model, so we tested the mice prior to uh, training. And at, prior to, it's not really training, it's stimulation. We only have a theory that links this stimulation to the meditation training that I described in human beings before. So this shouldn't be called training. It's really a kind of uh, stimulation. Uh, what we did to assess the mouse negative affect or fear was to use the time they dwelled in a dark part of, the, uh, of their environment compared to a light part of their environment. This is a standard mouse test for fear or anxiety. We had known from Yuan's work that five days to a month of meditation training in comparison to relaxation will reduce self-reported anxiety and also reduce the cortisol secretions to a cognitive challenge. This, in his case, mental arithmetic was the challenge to uh, produce uh, increased stress and therefore more cortisol. So we found that after training, the mice that were in the experimental group, here labeled in uh, yellow, showed greater time in the light. That is, they spent more time in the light than those of the control group. And they also showed more vertical rears, that is, more looking out at the environment, more orienting to the environment. So we did find that uh, a month of stimulation in the anterior cingulate, 8 hertz stimulation, was uh, effective in changing the behavior, one of the behaviors that we found changed in, mo in, in uh, meditation. A another uh, change that we found was the uh, activation of, pre of precursor oleodendrocytes, which are located along these axon pathways. For many years, they were thought only active during childhood, that is, during de child development until adulthood, and therefore produced the change in white matter that everyone agreed occurred in development. But in recent years, this has changed, first with work in uh, multiple sclerosis, which showed that Precursor oligodendrocytes could be activated in response to the challenge of demyelination. And uh, we found also that following uh, our stimulation, we got good evidence of increased, act, uh, increased uh, numbers of oligodendrocytes that became active during the period of time that we were doing the stimulation. There is a puzzle here, however. We found here that one hertz stimulation rather than eight hertz stimulation was better in, ch in the change of the oligodendrocytes. We don't know exactly why. We thought of the eight hertz as more typical of the theta rhythm, but perhaps it is the case that uh, the optimal frequency may lie between one and eight. We don't know. But we do know that we were able to. Uh, produce greater active oligodendrocytes following the uh, stimulation than uh, had been there before for the 1 hertz group and also in that direction for the 8 hertz group. Our next step, which we haven't taken yet, is to use electron microscopy to examine in detail the uh, degree of myelination and ch possible changes in the density of the axon. 
So this is a, an ideal slide for a person who's a would-be forester, as I am. Uh, this is actually not a tree, but an axone. And we can measure the axonal density here. The idea was it, the idea is that it might change between before stimulation and after stimulation. And we can also look at these beautiful rings around here of myelin and see if the number of rings have increased with uh, activation. Uh, even though maybe we haven't got the final evidence yet on the electron microscopy, we would want to uh, try to take another step that may be more important than what I've said for uh, this audience. And that is, could we do this in human beings without meditation, but by imposing a rhythm on the anterior cingulate? We cannot use the method of tailor making the mouse so that they will respond to light <laughs> stimuli. Uh, so far, the IRB would not agree with that. <laughs> We are hoping, however, that we can find some non-invasive ways to impose this activity, either through sensory stimulation, which although it's activating sense organ, may also activate the anterior cingulate, which is highly connected, or through electrical stimulation at very low levels, or through biofeedback, that is training you, not necessarily through a meditation technique, but training you to put yourself in a state where you produce the most possible uh, uh, theta by uh, sh giving you feedback on the amount of theta and hoping you can increase them over time. We're in the midst of trying this now. I can't tell you whether it'll work. So what I tried to do is to uh, maybe reinstate the pathways of addiction that were talked about really by Tavi and also by Dr. Compton. So you've had a lot of tuition on the fact that at least we believe at this moment that there are specific neural pathways that underlie at least some of the addictive responses. I introduced you very briefly to the idea of integrated mind-brain training, uh, mind-body training, which we have uh, published quite a bit on and showed some of its cognitive, its affective, and its stress reduction effects, uh, which are all done in, in randomized trials, with uh, generally with relaxation training as the control. I also tried to show you that we could actually use IBMT to reduce the amount of smoking in smoking subjects who did not really intend who weren't necessarily intending to quit smoking. The idea being that maybe this is a way to use neuroscience rather directly. If in fact there is a deficiency in this pathway and we change the pathway, maybe it doesn't matter what you think about it. Now I know this could be pretty radical and uh, <laughs> because of course it says some of the things that you were saying may, may not be absolutely necessary. I don't know if it's totally true. It's an experimental project that we're trying to work on. But the idea might be that we could actually reduce addiction to tobacco or perhaps to other uh, addictions as well by this kind of activity. And of course, to get people to think that they might do this, I think we really do have to say, what is the real mechanism involved? And what I've tried to do is to find the mechanism for the white matter change. It might not mean that everything that is done in meditation will be duplicated by the theta rhythm in the, front, in the anterior cingulate. But it does seem so far to fit, the data seem to fit with this account of at least the white matter change that occurs through meditation. And then I introduced the idea that perhaps we'll be able to find a non-invasive way to do this in humans so that in addition to the tool of meditation training, we might be able to offer people other tools that might go directly to change in the ability for self-regulation. Thank you. <laughs>